All right. It looks like we are ready to debut the first ever fun and interactive podcast. This is going to be a regular thing with me and the Justin Larson. All right. Woo! Let's go ahead and take off take off the starting soon message because we have officially started. So for this first one, we have been talking a bit, Justin and I, back and forth about data, specifically, um, you know, tracking our own games, what it means when we look at a month in review, and we thought that would be uh, a great one to start with because our month just ended, so the August season has just ended. It's a great time to kind of take a look back, and in particular, specifically this month, we had a... Well, let's just say it was a month where a lot of people were voicing uh, negative things about the meta, and there were a lot of complaints uh, on a couple of different sides of the meta, and I kind of wanted to talk about what my own experience was, and kind of, you know, hopefully explain why things went the way they did, how, how a meta shifts, and... You know, hopefully explain to at least new players how these things come to be, how you can predict them, and then, you know, what you can do to, you know, kind of be a step ahead in some cases. Um, it's going to be fun. I'm also curious to hear what, you know, Justin's uh, results were or his point of view about the meta, because I know that he was one of the people that was starting to get a little burnt out, so... Yeah, this will be a good time. I, I want to say, first of all, I'm glad we're finally doing this. This is going to be great. We've been talking for months about doing a podcast. Yeah, we actually kind of have. Um, it didn't really sneak up on us. It wasn't like we just decided today, hey, let's do a podcast. Justin and I have been um, sending messages back and forth like, hey, we should really do this. Hey, I want to do it. And I'm the kind of person that I hate doing things half-assed, so I'm the one who's probably been holding us up but we're just going to rip the band-aid <laughs> off and uh, let my anxiety ride and we're going to we're going to do it live. And I think this is an important important topic like you said, not just because of uh, where the meta's at and like seeing if like the statistics back up the complaints, but also because uh, you know we just had some balance changes and it'd be interesting to see, you know, if the numbers demonstrate that some decks are not as powerful as we're, you know, we've been thinking they are. Right. So uh, if you are watching this uh, as we talk live, uh, you can definitely see some numbers on the screen. And these are like some quick snapshot numbers about uh, my games. So since December, actually since before that, but meaningfully since December of last year, I started tracking my uh, wins and losses, if I was going first or second, uh, the classes I was playing against, the uh, archetypes, um, I've made some changes, so uh, spoiler alert, going forward we're going to get even more data and I'm hopefully enlisting a few people to also kind of uh, feed this, so for future projects. More, more, more data. Yeah, more data, right? Our data is going to have data. Um, I, haven't seen this much, I haven't seen this much data entry since uh, that Star Trek episode where Counselor Troy wanted to learn about robot love. <laughs> oh man. But, uh, so, yeah, I don't even know how to respond to that. Um, I, 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 whenever I say data, just one quick aside here, right? Whenever I say data or I talk about data, and mentally I want you to know I'm envisioning data from Star Trek Next Generation. Like, I'm having an interaction with data the character. Data's great. Um, but, yeah, so I kind of just wanted to say, like, we are going to take a little bit more in-depth look at this, and I'm going to highlight some things. But if you are looking at the screen, that's what you're seeing. Um, at some point, I'm going to talk about some historical stuff as well. So you may see that I'm going to go through previous months uh, to look at some things. But, uh, yeah, I kind of want to talk about, you know, representation. Again, this is just going to be my sample size. Um but like representation of uh, different classes and different deck styles. And I also want to talk about our friend the ring a bit tonight. So that also uh, is going to be a little bit interesting as well, I think. Are we taking the ring to Mordor tonight? Um, I don't think it needs to go to Mordor, personally. 
I think that the ring does not need to be destroyed, but we'll we'll look at that. So, um, before we talk about numbers, though, right? So, like, let's talk about let's talk about the the difference between perception and what data says, right? So, uh, sometimes they align and sometimes they don't. So, before we dive right in, Justin, if I were to ask you, like, what would your you know, description of the meta be without looking at numbers, right? Like, if I just said to you, like, hey, what's the meta like, how would you describe that to me? Uh, rock, paper, scissors. That's how I would describe the meta. I think I, um, the impression that I, I, I have just, like, not with data behind it, um, is that uh, as of Skyrim came out, there were a whole host of mid-range decks. You could play. You could play a couple different aggro decks successfully. A couple different control decks successfully, and there were there are enough cards at a high enough power level, I think, in Heroes of Skyrim that have come out that uh, there are clear winners in each deck archetype that are significantly stronger in most cases than um, you know pushing the their archetypes to these extremes, right? And um, now that's not necessarily always true, but uh, it feels like the best decks are significantly better than other decks that might appeal to people who want the same kind of play. You know, it's interesting that you talk about, like, clear winners and losers, because I I felt like that was definitely the case with Heroes of Skyrim as well, not just in, like, archetypes, but I think just in general the rock paper scissors formed but then what's even worse is like there's very clearly like a best version of each of the different archetypes at least in my mind right like right, right. prior kind of what I yeah, yeah yeah no i i'm i'm 100 percent on board with that and i think i i agree it's one of those you know prior and even like in the first couple of weeks of heroes of skyrim you know there were different ways to maybe play the same archetype and i there are still different ways to do it now but i really do believe that there are some pretty like clear like this one is just better than the alternatives and it kind of you know if you want to be competitive uh kind of forces you into those pigeonholes so um so like when you say rock paper scissors right and talk about the best decks like in your mind what would be the actual rock paper scissors right now again not before we dive into the data i, I just want to get some like anecdotal discussion first and then we'll kind of see if it aligns well totally anecdotally i mean the types of decks i like to play are full of full of big dumb monsters and stupid combos and uh not like win the game combos but just things that i find uh kind of adorable and um those decks are sort of the pinnacle of those decks are these uh scout ramp decks that reanimate giant bat over and over again right and um like you know like you said there are, there are different ways to build scout ramp i think that the reanimator giant bat variety is uh the clear clear uh best version of that deck but um in response to the overwhelming popularity of that deck uh these decks full of reach and charge creatures have become really popular and it's not that these are just unbeatable decks um the scout deck or the uh creatures but in the past there have been a class of control decks that was kind of keeping these small reachy decks in line and uh scout does such a good job of handily defeating those that uh you know that those are the two pillars of the game right now and then you look for decks that beat the uh chargey reach decks uh these mid-range decks and those would be the other pinnacle i guess of the vendor of the of the meta and there you know you do have a little more diversity in that area you have some archer stuff you have some assassin stuff even some mid-range mage players hanging on um but those i think would be the rock paper scissors of the meta yeah, I think that's probably what everybody kind of views it as as well. And so here's the spoiler alert. Uh, the, the data kind of shows it. Again, at least this is uh, my data. So um, I track all my ranked games. I played 330 ranked games this season. Uh, it's not a lot. I do not get to play as often um, as some of the much better players than I, obviously, just because uh, of the nature of my work schedule. But, you know, I played 330 games between, you know, rank 5 and Legend and my time at Legend. And uh, this, so this first thing that we're looking at, right, this, this total, like, upper quadrant thing here is just like a quick breakdown of these are the decks that I played on the left. 
And then these are my win losses against classes, right? And then we'll all see uh, total games down here. Uh, and then I got win rate on the right and then some aggregate stuff uh, and so forth. So uh, as we're looking at class representation, um, Shocker, right? Uh, Scout was the class that I played against the most. I played out of my 330 games, I played 56 of those games against the Scout class alone, right? So mm -hmm. for those of you who you know, want to see how math works, right? If I say 56 divided by 330, boop. So that's 17% of my games. So when you think about a, a game that's got, you know, 10 different classes, if things were balanced across the classes, you would theoretically expect to see it be around 10%. Uh, historically, that's like never been the case. We've never been balanced around 10% because poor Monk was, you know, overshadowed for many, many many months and continues to be and um but 17 percent is high um the next closest right are mage and crusader and that's yeah. mage at 49 crusader at 48 in terms of times that i played against them and the interesting thing about that is that those are um basically representative of the other two pieces of the uh, rock paper scissors triangle that you were describing right crusader has been uh, pretty overwhelmingly popular uh, in the token variety. I saw some Control Crusader creep up at the end of the month, but for the most part, mo the majority of the games I played against uh, Crusader, it was the token variety uh, for a couple of reasons. One, it's got a great matchup against Scout, and two, it got the monthly reward card from July, which always uh, typically increases the popularity of that class. And then Mage is home to Control Mage and Token Mage, so I am not shocked that that was up there as well. The rise of Crusader tokens has just been fascinating to me. You know, like, I feel like, I mean, you know, you talked about how unpopular Monk was for a long time. I feel like Crusader has been historically unpopular as well. And, uh, I mean, like, I was just thinking back to, the, you know, we're having the Epic Gauntlet this weekend. The And the last time we did that, I think I was the only person who placed with Crusader in the top, like, 200. Uh, yeah, no, that was, I, I feel like that was correct. Um, it was... <laughs> What scout, a, what the popularity of scout has done to the meta that we're reaching into things like token crusader, right? Well, I mean, I think it's twofold. I do legitimately feel like it's won the popularity of scout. So, you know, again, I'll kind of talk a little bit more about the impact of that in a second. But I also think that you know the monthly reward card and Heroes of Skyrim both helped it out immensely, and it might have just taken a little bit for people to kind of get on that bandwagon because right. you know Crusader's assault and the new house carl are in my opinion anyway a big reason that that deck is now as successful as it is because it helps you shore up some of your previously bad matchups um, specifically control so control does you know usually favor uh itself over tokens right like tokens Good. queuing into control controls favored to win um, but that margin has been kind of closed a bit because of those two cards because you can now reload your hand so that essentially, at least in my experience this month, and I played a lot of games on Token Crusaders. You can see up here I played 155 of my 330 games on it. Um, I was only losing to really control if they got Ice Storm twice because I could basically refill my hand and survive the first one. And then it was the second one that was always the nail in the coffin for me, realistically. So uh, you can see, you know, when I look at my win percentage against Mage, now again, archetype's not taken into account here, so some of this is against Token Mage, but I'm 14 and 11 against Mage overall. So either my win rate was fantastic against Tokens and horrible against Control, or I was probably more likely, you know, splitting control mage and then just slightly better like in the per, you know pretend mirror if you will uh, but the fact that i had positive against a class that's supposed to be rough i think speaks to how powerful those draw effects are i mean the old you know when when the game launched into open beta and uh a lot of new players moved towards spell sword tokens the uh i mean there was the, the 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 thing was always you just put them in top deck mode they can't win right that deck has no reach and that deck draws no cards right and now i think token crusader draws more cards than any other deck you can find on the ladder 
Yeah, I mean, maybe, it's hard. Maybe uh, Ultra, maybe Ultra Assassin draws more cards, but Ultra Assassin is also just not a great deck. Yeah, I was gonna say I think Ultra Assassin probably tutors slash draws for more cards, but yeah, I mean, it's hard to outdraw Token Crusader at this point. Um, between the Priests and East March and Crusaders Assault, the House Carl. Um, you even have uh, Thieves Guild Shadowfoot as you know card advantage. Yep, pseudo cards drawn. I have seen some people running that. Um, yeah, it's. It's a it's a brutal deck to try to outvalue. Like I think it's almost harder to outvalue that than it was old archer, like old you know, soul rest into soul rest into triumphant yarl oh, archer. Yeah. Um I felt like that deck used to just like vomit cards and I think that this new token crusader uh really rivals it or potentially even puts it to shame. So um I completely agree. So what's interesting to me, so as we kind of look at the numbers, right? So the representation in terms of class don't don't really shock me. Um, the win rates of the decks that I would expect to see have good win rates don't shock me. Now, some of these are small sample sizes, um, right? I mean, you know, I, I try to put somewhere between at least 10 and 20 games on any deck before I uh, uh, judge, but for the most part, like, you know, Ramp Scout, I had a positive win rate. Uh, Midrange Assassin, I had a positive win rate. But I'll be honest, I think all but, like, five of those games were before the Atromancer nerf. Um, Charge Battle Mage, uh, a.k.a. Time to Fight. I'm sorry, Ladder, for what I did to you. I still had a positive win rate. Um, Goblin Archer, positive win rate, right? Like, those are the things I would expect. And then I've got horrible win rates on basically anything I tried that was new. Um, so I tried then Orc Battle Mage. I was like, you know, the Orc package is mostly red. Let's just throw in the, the blue Reach cards and give it a go. Uh, didn't work. Um, I tried like a new version of Temple Archer for a bit. Didn't work. Uh, Sorcerer didn't work. Uh, Control Crusader I actually think is better than my performance, but I only played four games on it. And I... I Basically, three. I think two of my three losses there were like I drew Manticora, Manticora, Mirak post Mulligan or something, right? So like I just got frustrated and stopped. Um, is your Control Crusader list running? Is that an unstoppable rage deck? Uh, yeah, that was the version I was uh, trying to run essentially. Um, now, but... I will say like, um, this is certainly I feel like one of the more stagnant points that the game's been at before, but. I I'd also feel like, go like, uh, what I say by that is that, um, you know, you, you've got games in there against, uh, you know, w where you're playing mid-range sorcerer, tempo archer, control crusader, and stuff. And I think a lot of other players are starting to try stuff like that as well. I mean, I got to be honest. I, I, at the end of last season, I uh, I played against more different things than I had in the last like three weeks. Three weeks. Yeah, I mean, I think people are going to be more inclined to try stuff. Um, so it's interesting, like, the month just rolled over, we got a new monthly reward card, surprise, surprise, it's, uh, one that's likely going to be played in Scout and other ramp art types, so for this first, I would say, five days, I would expect people to be playing that heavy, um, and then I expect after that, people that, uh, you know, aren't hardcore grinding will probably try some new things again, and then as we hit about the middle of the month, it's just going to settle back into our rock, paper, scissors. Because ultimately, um, in my mind, as much as I want to try new things, I just don't see how they break the rock, paper, scissors as it currently exists. Um, and I, that's kind of why I wanted to showcase that like, I was trying some of these things, but I kept losing. And it ultimately just comes down to, um, you know, if, if I'm going to play Scout in almost you know one out of every five games... And I'm not in a position where I can outvalue it, which you just like can't, and I can't race it, then I'm just going to lose, right? And you have to plan for it because of the popularity. The popularity is kind of what dictates things. It's not Scout's power level, um, because there are certainly decks that beat it. It's just that it's, it's, it's a strong matchup against certain decks, and it's popular. And that said, I, and you know, I see lateral Alice uh, nineteen posting different things don't work, and and I agree a lot of, I mean, as a guy who kind of prides himself on playing things that no one else is playing, like I I really struggled last season to have a good time, <laughs> but I in the end I think that there are a couple 
kind of super unpopular deck archetypes that uh, that have some good game against like rock and paper, for instance, right? Uh, I, I think that um, there's hope to be found in uh, control assassin lists and in ramp warrior lists. I just want to throw that out there. I really think that's true. I, I mean, I think we'll find out here in this first week specifically if ramp warrior is going to be a thing. Um, I I personally don't think that it'll have enough juice to overtake scout um just because like i think it can take scout in the mirror but i don't think that it's going to i don't know if it's going to compete enough because it, like his mage is such a clutch card for scout and the fact that the ramp warrior doesn't have anything like in that same vein as i think ultimately what hurts it right like the 357 opener is so important to ramp and when I say 357, uh, in the past it would have been like Tree Minder slash Hiss Grove into Hiss Mage into Soul Terror on Hiss Mage. Now, Soul Terror got nerfed, but we got the new cards. So, you know, your ideal scenario there, um, you know, against any deck that's not aggro is, you know, 357 into the new card. Now, against aggro, obviously, you, you want different things. Um, but for every non-aggro matchup if the scout starts with a 357 i like i just don't know how you beat that deck so you're right i mean i think that the odds of uh i don't know i mean for every game that a scout player goes tree minder or hiss grove into thorn hiss mage i think there's two or three games where that doesn't happen and i mean it's not like you have to like i think you should build your decks to play around the worst case scenario like certainly but uh, I'm just saying, like, if, if your objective is to to have a positive win rate and not play one of the, the decks that everyone else is playing, I think that Control Assassin and Ramp Sorcerer or Ramp Warrior are totally viable options. That's not to say that they're tier one, because there's a very clear line between what is the be what are the best decks and what are not. But I just want to yeah. make sure so that it's clear. For me, one of the things that I've been kind of thinking about, right, is this idea of like knowing knowing what your expected percentage or expected outcome is right so like one of the reasons in my opinion that scout drives control mage out as hard as it does is that it's not just that scout is favored is that it's heavily favored it's not like scout is winning you know six out of ten or even seven out of ten of those games right um so like if we look at my numbers here uh, I tried to make Control Mage work for a bit. I put 36 games in it, and I had a less than 50% win rate. I went 16 and 20. But when you kind of dive deeper, I went 16 and 20, but I went 1 and 10 against Scout. Right? So, like, if you take Scout out of out of my my matchup there, then, you know, I'm suddenly at, like, a, a much better, certainly positive win rate. You know, I would be at 15 and 10 at that point. So, I think Control Mage again like could be that third piece of the triangle that we all like need it to be and keep you know tokens in check but the problem is that two things happened uh you know token crusader uh kind of closed the gap on control mage a bit so it's not as heavily favored there and it's nowhere near even close to trying to take games regularly from scout again i'm not saying it doesn't happen i've had nights where i beat scout like three or four times in a row in control mage um, but it just, it just, it's so, it's so like, you're almost better off. I know a lot of people who were climbing with control mage last season, and they said that they were better off, uh, climbing if they auto conceded to scout the minute that they queued into it, just so that they could queue and find other decks. And the fact that scout is so heavily favored there is what I think is honestly killing it, right? Like if, again, if it was closer to that, you know, even 70, 30, 60, 40, um, I think you might have a chance to climb. And so when I think about new archetypes that could crack it, for me, it's maybe you're either trying, you're basically, you're going to try to do one of two things. You're either going to say like, I'm going to do what Scout does. Like, I'm just going to find a deck archetype that I win nine out of 10 games and then hope I can split on the rest. That's one right. path. The other path is you're going to have to try to do something where you're the jack of all trades and you maybe have like a 55% win rate against everything. And I think Archer is the closest. Um, and I think that there might be room for a mid mage um, 
to to maybe crack it. Like I've been kind of theory crafting a bit the idea of bringing back mid mage, but your mid mage also runs like Ice Storm and Atromancer, right? Like it's not control mage. You don't want to go to Manticora top end. It's literally just like you know Dawnstar healers and board control stuff. But then you also run Ice Storm for the token matchup, and then um, hopefully you can get underneath Scout enough. Um, I, I don't think that it's going to be favored against Scout, but if you can even get it to where you're, you know, 40, 60 against Scout, it might be enough to maybe make that worth laddering with. Um, yeah. but like, that's, I mean, that's, that's just it, right? Like it's, it's kind of sad where we're in a meta where you're just hoping to not lose nine out of 10 games against something. You know what I mean? Yep. When you were talking about those, like, try, looking for a 55% win rate type of things, it, it reminds me of something we were talking about before we got started, and something we've talked about in the past, which is historically part of the problem with um, uh, labeling things the best deck or, like, using anecdotes about win rates and stuff has been that the types of people who usually compile this data are above average players, right? I mean, you know, like... Uh, just as an example, I mean, I'm not like a great player, but what I am is a heavily invested in and in, 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 uh, in franchised player. So I've put a lot of time into this and I think about Legends quite a bit. So when I hop onto the ladder with, you know, like a ramp warrior deck, that have win rate against all sorts of stuff that like the average Legends player, which is who the game should be catered towards, isn't going to be able to beat, right? And it's not because I'm great, but it's because I've spent the time to figure this out and I've spent a lot of time thinking about it. And uh, that's why I think that it's important that we get this this tracking information out to the to everybody, right? So that like the guy who plays four or five games of Legends a week can track their data, you know, so that we get a, a clearer picture of what's actually happening. Yeah, I mean, data is really important because, well, one, our, our, let me preface this: like, I'm biased. Um, I work in data governance as one of my day jobs, so like, I'm always going to be like, hey, you should look at data, right? Um, but like data is important for me because when I think about like how you want to attack the meta, like legitimately the entire concept, the entire idea of a meta is that you're trying to give yourself an advantage before you've even queued up, right? Before the game even begins through deck building, through knowledge of what's out there, you're trying to essentially, uh, give yourself an advantage because you're you're knowing what to expect going in, right? And so data is like the best tool in my mind to help you with that, right? If you know what you've been seeing, if you then can plan for what you can expect to see, um, you're, it's going to give you a leg up. So I've, I'm always a big proponent and I always say whenever the these types of discussions come up, I say like, hey, you should track your wins and losses. You know, you should track if you get the ring, you should track those things. So... Um, I I totally agree with you. I I just I, you know somebody's asking about where they can get this spreadsheet, and I think it's important, like I said, that we get this out there so that the conversations that we're having about this are much more informed. You know, I mean, I I I'll be honest. I listen to everything Lateralis nineteen Lateralis says about the meta because this is a guy who plays way more than even I do. And uh, but what I want to hear from is what the the latter experience is for the guys who don't haven't the guys who haven't seen you know, only rank five through legend for the last year and a half. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I totally agree. And so for me, the big thing is, is like, we do hear from them, but it's usually like, and it's not a disrespect to them. Right. But it's usually like the rant, like rage fueled, you know, I just played against, you know, scout five times in a row and like it's busted. So, uh, you know, I'm posting on Reddit now and I'm upset and blah, blah, blah. And like that happens. Um, but you know, that's, to me, that's like the anecdotal data and like streaks are a thing. Like any statistician will tell you that you can usually tell if somebody presents you like fake data, right? Like, so like hand created by somebody and then actual generated data, let's say from like a roulette wheel or something like the real data will have streaks. Like there will be runs. Like even if you flip a coin, you know, the real data is going to be the ones that have you know, times where you got heads seven or eight times in a row, um, because that's just the nature of real random, like that happens. So, um, that's, well, that's just witchcraft, man. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, so like, while it's important that those people say things like, Hey, I ran into scout like five times in a row to me, it's like, yeah, but like, what's it been for like the last two weeks? Right. Because again, like I've had nights where I didn't like 
two second to last night on ladder, I played against one scout across 22 games or whatever it was, right? And I know that that's not representative of my entire season, but like if I had just logged in and I played that night and then I went to Reddit and saw everyone saying like scouts everywhere, I would have been like, you're crazy. Like that's asinine. I played against one in 20 games. Like, so I, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. So it's, so it's one of those. Um, I'm going to hopefully uh, actually share the spreadsheet thing because I actually posted a link to a shareable version with instructions on how to set it up on a YouTube video forever ago. So if I can get that going, I will actually share it with uh, some peeps. There we go. So for the people asking in chat, uh, a long time ago I made that. Um, I've got an updated version, but I'm not ready to share it to public quite yet. Uh, and when I do, I'll probably do another video. But uh, that is that is what I've been using for a bit. So. Um, and this is really easy to use stuff too. I mean, just in case anyone's curious, like I am a bit of a Luddite and certainly an idiot. And uh, Charmer was able to explain how this all works to me in about two minutes. And uh, I'm, I'm hyped to use it, honestly. Because, I mean, I have a notebook where I've been keeping track of this stuff for about a year now. And uh, looking back on it, it doesn't even make sense to me. And I, I, I wrote it. So, in terms of the meta, right? So, before I segue to the second topic that I wanted to hit, um, because I have been tra tracking my uh, games for a long time, and I do want to look at some historical stuff. I want to pose the question to you. Um, yeah. What do you think either could happen or needs to happen to break the like the stranglehold of the the definite triangle? Like, how do we get back to? Um, you know, I mean, we're never going to have like a fully like balanced meta, but how do we get back to, you know, where there's like two or three decks of different archetypes and, and things like yeah. that? Well, possibilities, right? Like the first possibility is that, um, you know, I think about like, so I played Hearthstone uh, for a while and, and I, I pl but I didn't play, you know, in the, in the early parts of Hearthstone. Um, and talk about, oh, the meta was so great when it was just the base set, blah, blah, blah. It's possible that uh, the truth is is that as the card pool expands, there will be less room, less wiggle room for uh, for variation in deck types because, like we like I mentioned earlier, you, there's going to be enough cards above enough above average cards in certain archetypes, certain that fit into a specific deck, that the meta naturally narrows, right? Because like you're no longer running. 35 fantastic cards and 15 filler cards you have the option of running 50 fantastic cards in which case like this is just the natural course of, of, of evolution for these sorts of games right uh the next possibility is that um something wrong with the meta and it can be more diverse like it was for a while um and, and again this is sort of anecdotal like uh it just feels to me like it's less diverse now um so i think the answer is uh, buffing underplayed cards. I mean, but like, look, I'm not a game developer. I certainly don't understand, you know, putting a drop in bucket A uh, to balance out buckets B through D is going to do to the game. But I get the impression that, like, uh, you know, you could add something small to Gerald Forager and change everything, right? Um, and if that's the case, it opens up possibility three, which is something I talked about on Twitter a while back, which is that maybe it's possible that the the best the best uh, meta for the game isn't uh one that's like something we've seen before maybe it's one that is constantly changing right like i understand this would require a huge investment of time and resources and research on the behalf on the on the part of direwolf but what if the game is just actually more satisfying if balance changes like dramatic balance changes are made like on a, on a bi-monthly basis that means every two months i think right yeah um and uh and, and, and intentionally shifting power away from one type of deck to another um, and seeing how people react. And, and granted, this is going to be uh, reasonably awful for um, people with small collections or free to play players. But I mean, we're a bunch of super enfranchised players right now and who are talking about this. And I, I get the impression, actually, that the game might be more fun if uh, things were dramatically changed pretty regularly. I mean, 
I could get behind that because it would at least create an artificial sense of freshness. Um, but I you know, would I would worry about you know exactly what you brought up, right? Like I don't want that to disinterest free to play players, disinterest um, even even non like free to play players, but just like the people who invest their time in like learning a deck or picking it up because like some decks are not easy to pilot right so like let's say it's not a free to play player but it's the person who you know they went out of their way to craft alter assassin and that's not necessarily the easiest deck to pilot and they learn it and whatever and then two weeks later because of like a drastic balance change not only is the deck just not good but maybe it's like wildly like card is non-existent like i i think about gwent so if you guys are not familiar with that game, they just recently went through a very, very massive like rework patch. Um, I've been playing through it a little bit lately, and it feels like a completely different game. Like pro players are saying it's way out of whack, things are w imbalanced. Um, you know, it's raining. Gwent is that game that's like math without any of the fun parts. Of yeah, it's right. basically playing solitaire. I, I'm joking, of course, because I actually do enjoy it. But it's, it's vastly different. It doesn't play at all like Legends if you've never given it a try. But my point is is that uh, Gwent is kind of looking to do that because they, I think their seasons are two months instead of one. But every season they do like a pretty big either balance patch and or introduction of new cards. So they've been very aggressive in their changes. But there's also... Uh, like turmoil that comes with that and like when you get it wrong you have the potential of it getting like really wrong like this game is foreign like when I signed in for this new patch it literally felt like I was playing a brand new game you know that other than like that the game board was the same and whatever right like it it's like I, I was I was playing risk and now I'm playing axes and allies you know like they're both on a board they're both showing me the globe and I know I need to attack people or whatever, but like the mechanics are way different. So, um, yeah, yeah I, would well, I, mean, I would worry about that. Maybe there exists a fourth option, right? Which sort of strikes the balance of not just screwing over new players, uh, or those who are less enfranchised than us or, um, and just accepting this as the fate of an evolving card game. Uh, you know, Legends has the monthly reward card, right? And a couple times, the monthly reward card has dramatically impacted the meta, right? Like, I think of Histgrove in particular. Um, but even, like, um, the 7-7 seven, seven for 6 giant, um, belligerent giant, not belligerent giant. Stampede, Stampede Sentinel. Sentinel. Yeah, Stampede Sentinel, I mean, was the impetus for me creating the uh, mid-range Crusader life gain deck. And, I mean, I'll be honest, I still believe that that was... A tier one deck for a long time again my win rates were absurd but like i'm also just a guy who plays too much but like i i think that you could theoretically introduce cards you know really targeted surgical cards through the monthly card reward system to shake things up on a monthly basis and and just a single card that you know maybe you get some free copies of even if you're a casual player i think could be a way to do that yeah i would prefer something like that i think eternal does a really good job of that you know, speaking of Direwolf's other game, because not only do they do, like, their set releases, but they do, like, their mini events and their promo cards, and even if it's just, like, a slow trickle, they're always at least doing something, and even if, like, they whiff on half of them, you know, the other half, they're, they're kind of hitting something. Um, Legends, I mean, a great game. yeah, like, the, the monthly reward cards are nice. One thing I will point out, I... Uh, let me preface this. I don't have any inside information. It's entirely my own speculation. But um, I feel like in about a month we're due for another influx of cards. And I say that because uh, we got Madhouse in December. We got Follow the Dark Brotherhood in March. Uh, we just got Skyrim in June. And so if we're on that like three month pattern, right, we should be looking at, you know, maybe end of September, early August, probably seeing something. And perhaps, or at least hopefully, that will be enough to shake us up. Like, I don't think it'll be a Heroes of Skyrim level expansion, but it would be kind of nice for, um, you know, Madhouse size, Fall of the Dark Brotherhood. I'm personally, I would like it to be like another story adventure because I enjoy those. Um, I could see them doing something smaller. I'd like to see them maybe even go a third option. So, one of the things that um, 
come you know comes up from time to time is the idea that um, they could raise the level cap so maybe it's not like a story adventure but maybe it's like an expansion of the core story if you will and they give us like a couple new cards that we can raise our level cap and level up but as long as it's just some introduction of content to to help shake things up um i i would personally like to see that i've been kind of joking around about like maybe my next episode of the forge i'm gonna throw in the idea of what i really want to see is a three three for three that says if my opponent has more max magicka than me reduce their max magicka by one right like land destruction in a way that combats ramp scout but isn't like oppressive and keeps like other people down right like it would only target the people who are ramping ahead of you but even stuff like that if it would trickle in i think would be kind of fun i'll be honest i hadn't even thought about uh the fact that we're like on schedule for potentially more content but uh that's pretty cool um and that would i mean look you know you mentioned something when i was talking about options about the the uh like maybe you said something like the illusion of, of of change and diversity, right? Like, like I feel like the, the for like a week after the balance patch, there was that sense that like anything was possible again. And I, I played a lot more than I had for a couple of weeks because I was facing a bunch of different decks as people were trying out new things. You know, I saw guys playing Brynholf, and uh, you don't put Brynholf in any of the uh, you know rock paper scissors, right? Yeah. So like, you had to build something different. I'm not gonna lie, I put Bryn, Brynholf in a deck, and um maybe enough to keep that illusion going for a couple of months right and uh i'll be i mean i'll be honest like i am less concerned about obje the objective r reality of this game than i am about my own subjective reality of it right like i'm not a competitive like tournament scene player uh <laughs> and what i I'm, I'm maybe you could describe as like hyper casual and what i want to do is just have a different unique experience every time i play the game maybe the best we can hope for is that illusion lasting for a couple months and then we die off into the the waiting for the next expansion yeah i mean to me i think that's why the expansion of the quote-unquote core story would be an interesting path should they choose to do it because they, they could trickle in a couple new cards give that illusion but then also give you know uh casuals or you know people who are not the ultra competitive some additional content to you know you have to find a way to provide that carrot on a stick for all your different player types right so competitive people now like i i don't log enough games to truly be competitive and when i do play my games it's usually really late after i've worked two jobs and dealt with kids so even when i am playing competitively like i'm dog ass tired and i typically don't perform super well right like it's why i don't finish high on the ladder but I aspire to be competitive because that's the kind of gaming I enjoy. So for me, the easy thing would be obviously some sort of tournament scene and things like that. And I think that's been, you know, kind of talked about a lot lately. We might talk about that in maybe a future one. Um, so I don't want to sidebar us, but like that's one carrot on a stick for one player type. But I think it's really important that we also, you know, feed people story and feed people casual avenues and do those things because... You know, if you talk about the game, it's got hundreds of thousands of downloads on Steam. Like, you can look up public metrics for that. It's got hundreds of thousands of downloads on Google Play. Um, I don't know how many on iOS. So, you're going to have players beyond, you know, the 200 of us that like to grind ladder at the top. And you need to find ways to keep them interested and do that carrot on a stick. And I really feel like, you know, one of the things that sets this apart from Hearthstone is uh you know the leveling and the leveling up of cards and the story mechanics and i think that they did a great job with the like initial release and that it needs to be revisited i think if you released a set like the madhouse collection where there are hidden gems like uh like like super powerful cards like uh stone shard orc or uh gardener of swords right in, in alongside a bunch of stuff that um, inspires Johnny and Timmy to play their ridiculous cards, I, I think you could have a good thing going with that. I, I, I mean, I think the Madhouse Collection is probably the most successful, uh, in my opinion, of the expansions, even though it's so small. Like because I spent time trying to build decks around every single card in that. 
Um, and as far as like what keeps the competitive players coming back, um, you know, the the Elder Sc the TESL Championship Series has demonstrated like I guess in the recent in recent weeks it's been a lot of tokens decks, but I mean you see a lot of diversity in those decks for the most part over the last couple months. And I think that if there's a tournament scene that like really holds the attention of the people who really want to play this game competitively, you're gonna see people wanting to play those decks um you know the, the tournament decks uh and they're not going to be the same decks that get you to the top of the ladder right yeah. you just release a small expansion full of cards that appeal to you know different demographics and then you introduce a professional tournament scene and i think that you're going to satisfy a lot of people yeah i mean so it's interesting to mention the idea of like seeing different decks in tournaments because I feel like back in like October, like we're talking almost a year ago, I remember I did a YouTube video and I was talking about even back then why Legends needed tournaments in a tournament scene. And the entire crux of my argument back then was that a good tournament scene has the capability of actually shaking up and affecting your ladder experience because there are certain decks that do fantastic in tournament formats that might not necessarily do great on the ladder, but if people see those decks be successful in a tournament, they're going to be like, hey, that was great. I liked that deck. I'm going to try it out. And then they're going to take it to the ladder, right? And that's going to shake things yeah. up. And if you're somebody who's planning for a tournament, similarly, like I don't like to take decks in where I haven't tested them, right? I want to pilot them a few times, work out the kinks, things like that. So I'm going to take those to the ladder as well. So I think that a tournament scene has the potential to at least help diversify things. Because right now with, with no, you know, I mean, yeah, we have the championship series and they're, they're doing the best they can. And I, I very, very much applaud their efforts. I don't know. I don't know how they do it. Um, but it just isn't uh, it isn't like as widespread and mainstream yet to where it's going to like get that trickle down. Right now, like if you just want to grind ladder, and if you're that casual player, like that's the worst part too, right? Like if you're that casual player who's like, hey, I just want like the monthly reward card. You know, I'm just gonna pick whatever the best deck is, grind till I hit like rank one or whatever, and then call it good. Um, you know, the illusion of what the best deck is might change if people have seen some diverse decks in the tournament, I guess is what I'm trying to say. It's a way to like yeah. advertise things. So I agree. As far as like diversity of the of the ladder goes, I would a million times rather have people net decking tournaments than uh, the, uh, the things that are posted on Reddit. Um, and, and don't get me wrong, like I really appreciate the, the time people put into posting those things on Reddit, but... Uh, I'm one of them. Shh. I post way more shit than I should on Reddit. <laughs> yeah. But like, I, I just feel like historically tournament scenes, I mean, this is actually more true in Hearthstone than it is in Magic, which is kind of interesting. But historically, like uh, the tournament scenes in, in digital card games have been really interesting places. Yeah, I think so. Um, I, I mean, I think that it can only only help. But, you know, again, I... As I said before, I think that's the carrot on a stick for some of us, and I would really, really like to see a few other carrot on a sticks in other areas. So, yeah. Um, and you know, you mentioned that you don't know how those guys in the the championship series do it. I totally agree. I want to give a shout out to Schwitty Ono and uh, Bradford Lee for just putting on some great shows. I mean, those guys bust their ass. I I was a a guest uh, commentator or whatever a couple weeks ago. And I was just blown away by how much work they put into that. Yeah, I, my biggest, I guess, complaint is just that because of my, my jobs and my schedule, I don't get to play in their tournaments often enough. So if they could be so yeah, kind well, as to work around my three jobs and wife and two kids, you know. Oh. Uh, I mean, I feel you, man. I also am not involved in a whole lot of those tournaments because I'm an awful player, actually. Well. <laughs> so, I want to segue to um, the other topic I kind of tease at the beginning, right? So, since this one is kind of data-centric and we talked about, like, this month in review, uh, another hot topic, in fact, I even think I saw a post on Reddit yet again today about it, but another hot topic that always comes up, it feels like, 
is the ring, right? And whether or not it is, um, you know, too powerful, too swingy, and I, just like before, before I scroll down and showcase some data, um, I wanted to, you know, ask you, right? Like, what do you feel about the ring? Do you think it's too strong? Do you think it's too weak? Do, you know, one of the th questions I see often posed is like, you know, uh, if you had the choice to always have the ring or never have the ring, you know, which would you pick? Yeah. And if you pick the ring, then obviously that's proof that it's broken, which is entirely subjective in my mind. But right, like, what's your, what's your? Uh, I'll be honest with you. I would rather have the ring every game. Um, my own personal data tracking, you know, I said I've been keeping notes in a notebook, uh, is that I win more with the ring. Um, but that said, it's like what you like to play, how you play and stuff, right? I don't, I tend to build decks whose curve starts at three or two or three, right? At least. And, uh, having the ring helps me with the kinds of decks that I really like to play. Um, that said, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I know the data must must exist for like how balanced the ring or ba not balanced the ring is, um, and uh, you know, relatively quick t to make balance changes. Direwolf and Bethesda are. I have to you know just reasonably assume that uh, the results are that it's pretty balanced as far as global win rates go. But I think there's definitely going to be certain players and the types of decks they play and the way they play and uh, and and certain decks in general that are played by all sorts of people that are going to win more or less depending on whether or not they have the ring and um that's my thought on it like i believe that it is probably balanced but i believe i would personally rather have it all the time well it's interesting because whenever this comes up you know i always say my, that my own, you know, personal response is it depends, right? Because I'm the kind of person, you know, like I said, I'm a data nerd, right? Like I would probably test ahead of time before a tournament and then I would see like, is this a deck that requires the ring? Is it not? Um, you know, Sorcerer uh, seems to always come up as uh, like the poster child example. Um, you know, I like to call it the Sorcerer's Ring sometimes. But that's because that's a, a kind of deck that like legitimately is snowbally right like when you think about what that deck's trying to do it wants board presence it wants to continue that board presence and then keep going so yeah. um you know in that case yeah i would ask for it but i don't think that saying i would take it is necessarily proof um that it is op and so i guess without further ado we're going to take a look at my august stats and then obviously i have all these tabs open so we're going to look at the ring uh for at least again this is just my sample size um, I did some checking today. Uh, the amount of games I play on average makes me only statistically significant with a confidence interval of about 7%. So unfortunately, grain of salt, right? Probably not a big enough sample size, but it's the only data that I have to work with. So um, without further ado, uh, in the month of August, my overall win rate for going first was 61.9% uh, across all decks. And for going second, it was 61.11%. So almost identical. Um, again, that's across all decks. I think saying across all decks is really important because I do think that there are some, again, decks and matchups where it might favor one way or the other. But and again, this is my own personal opinion. I don't think that you balance for one deck. I don't think you balance for one matchup. Um, I... I think that it's important that it is, you know, taken into account for an aggregate because the minute you start balancing for one deck or one matchup and then that changes through either the introduction of new cards or popularity on the ladder or meta, then you skewed things drastically in one way or the other, right? So uh, they're very yes. close. Um, but then even if I look at like some of my individual uh, decks, right? Like uh, Token Crusader that I had the most games on, uh, 69.23 going first, 72.73 uh, going second. So a little bit higher going second, but as far as like I'm concerned, like a 3% nudge in one direction or the other isn't necessarily a huge deal to me personally. Um, and I say that just because like whenever you talk about balance, the goal is to try to get things as close to 50-50 as you can. So in my mind, if things are you know, two or 3% within, you know, reaching each other, 
I would say to myself, if we made a change or if we did something different, is it going to make it that much closer or is it going to throw things more out of whack? And I'm just, you know, hard pressed. Um, and again, we'll go through the historical stuff, but I'm personally hard pressed to see how making a change would bring us closer to 50-50. So, uh, but like even, you know, again, a small sample size, right? But like Ramp Scout, um, I actually had a shitty win rate going second, uh, six and six, and going first, I was seven and one. So to me, that's reflective of the small sample size, right? Like it's, I would be shocked if you were to say like the choice was always to pick going first with Ramp Scout. Um, but, but yeah, uh, I, what, uh, I know you said that your stats favored going second. Um, yeah. but do you know how close they were? I don't. Look, I can't possibly get through all this stuff right now, but I here I do know that for a long time I was tracking my mid-range crusader win rates and I mean I was over 50% with 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 and without the ring, but I was closer to 70% with the ring and closer to 65% without it. So it was a small difference, but Yeah, so 5%, I mean, that's, sure. And then that it, for, to be fair, that's a deck with like nine two drops and then a bunch of three drops. So <laughs> that was a deck that did a lot better with the ring. So, again, I'm mostly going to focus on, like, my overall, because I, my, my sample sizes for most of these are going to be probably too small on the individual matchups, and, and I am cognizant of that, but as I always say, like, it's the only data I got, and some data is better than, than no data. Um, and as I said before, my, my overall, like, aggregate is going to be, uh, you know... A roughly 7% like confidence interval. Um, so, but this was for August, right? So within 1% of each other, like that's, to me, that's ideal in terms of like win rate balance. So if I go back to July, right? So this is back what we did in July. Going first, the, July I played like shit, by the way, preface. <laughs> um, going first, it was 53%. Going second was 60. This, I think, we'll double check here in a second, but I think this was the largest disparity that I ever had. So that's seven, right? Seven percent difference. Uh, if I go to June, June, uh, sixty percent for going first, fifty-six and uh, basically in a half uh, going second. So uh, four or five percent change there. Uh, that favors going first though. May, right? May I barely played any diversity. Like I was mid-range king there. I was archer, sorcerer, assassin for like all of May. Um, but going I, first, I just, just real quick, by the way, I hate you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, going first, we had a 70% win rate, uh, that month going second was 66. So again, about a 4% difference, but still favored going first, going back to April, right? We got 56.94 going first, but 53 and a half going second, uh, again, like 4% difference favors going first. So, but you know what this, what this really says is it's time for more data. I mean, like, I think that's yeah. why it's important that we get this this the spreadsheet out to people, right? So that we can have more informed arguments about this. Because I know that you've, you've said before, you kind of feel like you're, uh, you know, shouting at a wall when you talk about the ring sometimes. Because you have been tracking your data for a long time. You know, a lot of people haven't, and a lot of it's anecdotal. And there's nothing wrong with people's anecdotes. Because, like I mentioned, I honestly believe that, like... Uh, the illusion is frequently more important uh, in, in the, my enjoyment of this game than the reality. Yeah, but absolutely. Like, getting people to track this data means we can all have a better discussion about it, and you know maybe we can come back in a couple months and have a you know a different look at how this all works out for everybody. Yeah, I. I mean, I, I would definitely like to see more data, and I there was one more thing I wanted to touch on, so. It, the the important thing is I wanted to say that at least with my small sample size, I kind of just wanted to show people because I, I will very frequently post on Reddit. See, this one favors going first as well. You know, I keep going back, but I'll frequently post like, hey, my stats actually show a minor bump to going first. And I'll get a lot of people who say like, well, what about, you know, this or that or whatever? And I'm just like, hey, like as far as I've been tracking historically, like that's what I got. Um, yeah. So I would like to see more. Uh, one of the things that I enjoy is uh, Ecstasy. So that's the guy who makes the deck tracker. Um, you, you know, enjoy Ecstasy. 
Yeah, uh, he. <laughs> those were some bad years. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I enjoy Ecstasy too, but I enjoy uh, this particular person because his deck tracker is set up so that it feeds data back to him. One, I don't know if a lot of people know that, but if you're using the deck tracker, um, it uh, feeds data back to him. So just know that. But you know, he'll say you know frequently that he has statistics for basically like you know thousands, tens of thousands of games. And that averaged over all those games, uh, there's next to no difference for players going first or going second. So, um, I want to say uh, to to WebNG uh, in chat, the reason I'm suggesting more data is that so like people who are coming into these discussions without the information can have their own information because sometimes it takes you know someone having their own experience to really. You know, because you can have an experience to sort of miss the meaning of it if it's if it's told to you, right? Like if you if you have the experience yourself and then you have the data in front of you to give it meaning, you know, I think that would have a more but a bigger impact than on just being told something, which is why I think it's important that people track this stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's one thing when people just like say, "Hey, I looked at it and it's fine," and then actually seeing it, and then I, the other thing that, like, I, I think the the the. the the data is important for a number of reasons. So things that you know commonly come up, and uh, you know I've seen them in other discussions. Uh, I've seen them a couple of times in in chat as well. Is uh, people want to see individual matchups, right? Now I said at the top of this uh, you know, again personally, I don't think that you balance for individual matchups, but people do want to see that, and I think it's important to know because it allows you to plan for those things, especially in a tournament scene, right? Like I want to know what my my expectation is against certain decks, uh, even more so, you know, with the championship series now featuring bans, I think it's even more important, right, to know which decks I need to ban. But, you know, people want to see individual matchups, and the only way you're going to see that really is, you know, by, let's be honest, like, t taking a look yourself. Um, but, you know, yeah, like, it's, it's just one of those things that if you don't... <laughs> If you don't account for everything, if you don't take the aggregate and you start, in my opinion, balancing for uh, specific matchups, like I said at the start, I think it throws everything out of whack. Similarly, there's two different arguments that I hear. Um, you know, one is that they should look at like uh, top performing players, and the other is that top performing players uh, have inflated win rates, so you shouldn't look at them. And my argument to that would be, I don't think that it's it, it's it's either. I think you just look at everybody again as an aggregate, right? Like I don't think that you balance a game that's been downloaded by hundreds of thousands of people for like 200 people. And I also I, don't I, think, I and I also don't think conversely, however, that uh, those 200 people should be ignored because they're the top 200. You know, they very clearly have a lot of knowledge of the game. Um, but I just think that you know, with all things, um, if you're trying to take full user experience into account. Um, you, I mean, you've got, you've got to kind of take things as, a, as an aggregate. Um, smart players, you know, those top 200, they're going to find the things that give them an advantage and they're going to find uh, where the imbalances lie more than anybody else. So, you know, the 10% the difference in a win rate for them is going to be significantly more important than a 10% difference, in my opinion, of your, like, your average player. Um, but I just... Like, I have a hard time buying that that's what you, you balance for, right? Like, it's, it just feels like a bad business decision to me. Well, I think this is, like, you know, you alluded to you with uh, reference to the bands. I think this is one of the things that a professional uh, tournament circuit, or, you know, whatever you want to call it, a competitive t tournament circuit, would really help. Because with the ability to ban decks, you're going to be able to eliminate, you know, if, if, if your thing is you don't want to play against the deck that if it gets the ring is going to stop you because of what you're playing or their play style or whatever, you have that opportunity to do that, right? And since, you know, the assumption I think a lot of us make, and probably rightfully so, is that there's going to be quite a bit of overlap between the people who are finishing top 200 legends, say, and the people who are going to be, uh, you know, sort of champions on this, uh, on, a, on a big tournament uh, scene. Um, I think they're going to be going into that with the knowledge that, hey, mid-range sorcerer, for instance, is the nuts when it has the ring. I, I'm going to decide not to take the 50 50 that they're going to get the ring when i play against that mid-range sorcerer deck and i'm going to ban it and i think that like like you said balancing anything in this game for the top legend players is a mistake 
Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know if it's like a hard mistake. I just don't think it should be like the uh, only decision made, right? Like the only primary driving factor. You know, like I said, I just, I hear two different sides of the coin and I don't think that either is 100% correct, right? Like I think it's some combination of the two uh, yeah. one way or the other. But as always, and like I said at the beginning of this, right? Like, you know, if you think that people should be taking a look at that, then, you know, take some initiative and, and do it, right? Like I can only work with the sample size that I have. Um, and I unfortunately don't have access to uh, ecstasy's statistics and even if i did i don't know the limitations in terms of like what gets reported back um yeah but well i so you know somebody mentioned something uh in chat i want to address too about reddit i i think that we should balance things exclusively on on what gets the most meme posts actually i think uh Jarl Balgriff deserves a huge buff and supreme atromancer should cost 16. That, that's my that's my thought yeah so somebody in, in chat, I think it's a fair question. He says, uh, please explain why balancing around the top players is a mistake. Wouldn't the top players uh, be the best people to balance it around? Um, and for me, I don't think that it's necessarily the best because the, the top players, because of their skill, because of their knowledge of their game, and I'm not even talking talking about myself, right? Like, I don't want this to come off as like super elitist. Yeah. I mean, I finish top 100 pretty regularly. Um, and I do so with a pretty limited sample size of games, but I would never like be so far gone as to say I'm a top player. But when I think about guys like, you know, turquoise link, who's always floating around the top, um, you know, if you watch his stream, you'll see him playing a bunch of different deck archetypes. And it's because he's always trying to figure out what comes like next in the meta right if he's seeing this and because of where he is positioned he's playing against a lot of the same people often i'm not saying he never gets pared down because he does but it's not uncommon to see him play against you know the top 25 ranked people or so pretty frequently and so he'll get kind of used to or know what to expect what people are playing at that level and then he can you know apply meta strategies and craft something to then beat them you know he was doing it very very uh well when control monk was a thing right like when there was all those different iterations of control monk he was always figuring out a way to kind of stay one step ahead of the others um and i'm not even saying that it's just link i'm just using him as as an example but so when you're doing that um that is something that's also going to theoretically like inflate and deflate win rates because uh, based around the ring because of the different like I'm not saying the ring doesn't matter but it's just one of those things where I think that trying to up your win percentage more before you've even queued into the match right like that idea of properly applying the metagame I think um, as much or even more influences those games right so your average person you know when they queue up are not going to be making those minor tweaks every two, three, four games, right? Most of them are, um, most of them are basically like they craft their deck and they might make a change, you know, once a week or whatever. And so they're, they're just, their experience is going to be different. So if you, I don't know, like if you just focus on the top, like, again, I don't want to discount. I'm not saying, I'm not saying don't include them, but like, if you just say like, again, we're only going to focus on these people, um, yes, there is uh, like truth to trickle down, right? And yes, the people below the top players will be trying to mimic them. And so that will also factor in. Um, I just, and again, this is my own uh, unprofessional personal opinion, but I feel like it would be um, potentially doing uh, an injustice. Uh, th maybe the best analogy I can give, and I understand it's not apples to apples because it's not a card game, right? But like, if you've ever played Overwatch, there's a pretty big skill disparity between uh, Genji that's a pro level and uh, a not pro level Genji. And that happens in card games too, right? Like I think about I mean, Magic the Gathering, like high level, you know, people who play like vintage control versus like not high level people playing vintage control. There's a big disparity. Um, and uh, even a Hearthstone, right? Patron Warrior, right? Patron Warrior, Patron Warrior is a rare case where I think that balancing around the pros was important, um, but that was just one of those things that, like, 
it, <laughs> that's a really good example, actually. I, I, I have to admit, I hadn't thought about that when I made my point about not balancing around uh, the top 200 players. I, I, because I think that the patron nerf was the correct move. I think that nerfing that deck was a good idea because it made the tournament watching experience better. Um, but again, this is one of those things where I'm much more concerned about the experience of people watching those tournaments than I am uh, with the experience of the people playing them. For the game that people have fun watching the diverse tournament scene than it is the people you know playing them are all playing the same deck. Well, no, no, granted, it's going to be more interesting if they're not all playing the same deck, but I'm just... Again, so, so much more concerned with the audience than I am with the players. Yeah, I think that's fair. So another question I want to pose, just because you know we're we're talking about the ring, right? Um, and this is another the the two things I always like to ask when the the ring topic comes up. The first is if you were to make any change, whether it's cooldown on charges, number of charges, whatever the case may be. You know, given what we've seen, at least with my small sample size and like with XSC's numbers that he talks about, I know Link said he tracked his numbers for like 200 games and found they were similar to mine. Um, do you think any change is really going to bring that gap closer? Because I, I guess my, and this is entirely anecdotal and subjective, right? And I admit that, but I guess to me, I don't see how making a change is actually going to bring us like closer to 50-50. And that would be the desired end goal, right? Yeah, I think it would be. But, you know, I'm, I'm going back and forth on it, actually, because I was just, you know, I'm, I'm keeping up with chat because I want to make sure that uh, you guys know that you're being heard. And I, I made the point earlier that the, the subjective uh, reality is more important than the objective reality. And I realized that, like, the, my point for thinking that the ring is okay is based on the, the, the objective reality, the stats we're all talking about, and that's why I was encouraging people to keep track of their stats. But, I mean, I, I have to take a step back and say that there is some merit to the idea that it feels better or it feels worse to have the ring in those three charges. And uh, it's making me question what I said earlier, actually. I mean, it does, but I guess my devil's advocate to that would be it also feels bad whenever prophecies are played against me, right? But we also know that objectively and that it's a core mechanic and 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 so on and so forth like i don't get me wrong i think that the feeling is really important it's important to player retention it's important to enjoyment um but like there are some some instances where you just kind of have to go like you know is is wildly like changing things or wildly imbalancing things worth that but like how much more unenjoyable is it going to be if um, it goes from, like, it felt bad when somebody had the ring to it feels really bad now that we've made X change because, like, my my win rate gap is, like, wider, right? I still don't think it needs to be changed. I, I don't. I just wanted to make sure that I made clear that, like, I can totally see both sides of this argument. And uh, I guess I was coming off as a little a little too convinced of my own argument earlier. See, it, see, it's interesting. This is exactly why I liked uh, looking at the data, because Mayo and Chad is saying, he sees no reason why you wouldn't always want the ring if you don't play a one drop. Um, it Having the ring should consistently win you more games. And, you know, I historically, right, at least for me, going back to December, found the exact opposite to be true. So um, that's that's why I think that the, the data is interesting and at least important to look at and... Uh, uh, and yeah, because it is a feeling thing, right? Like it's one of those, I think that the biggest problem with the ring is that it's something that's like tangible, right? It's not I just, times, I can't tell you how many times I, I've, I've recorded a video where I didn't have the ring and I said, well, we don't have the ring and that's a bummer. Yeah, because you can immediately see it. And it, it's not like, you know, going first versus going second has its own consequences, um, and especially in a game like this, like, look, the core mechanic in this game is that the attacker chooses targets. It's going to favor whoever has initiative, right? So the ring in this game, because of uh, lack of quality one drops uh, right now, means that you basically have initiative because you're likely to play first. And so that's why it feels good. But even more so beyond the going first, going second, like you can see it. It's it's tangible. It's not just like, oh, I'm going first this game, but it's like I'm staring at my opponent who has the ring and I feel the pain every time he activates it. 
So I think that it does more to create that emotional like response and that negativity that makes you further ignore like the actual outcomes. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I, the, the deck that comes immediately to mind for me is when I'm playing any janky mid-range deck of mine and I'm playing against mid-range sorcerer. This hasn't happened in a while, but I'm playing against mid-range sorcerer and I don't have the ring. I mean, I, that's a really hard feeling. Yeah, or to me, it would be any time I see Goblin Skulk off the ring. Goblin Skulk is my own nightmare one. fuel, you know what I mean? But I guess... That's, that's the other one, I totally agree. Yeah, but like not even thinking about the plays, right? I'm kind of just musing about the psychology. Like, when I played Magic competitively, and I would go to a tournament, you know, we would roll a die to figure out who would go first or second, and then, to be honest, after that point, I was almost never thinking about who went first or second. Because it's a quick interaction, there's nothing more, like, that's uh, tangible, there's nothing else that, like, interacts with it. But psychologically, yeah. you know, with the ring, like, it's not just, okay, he got to go first, you know, it's a slight advantage or whatever. Like, you're seeing somebody, you know, use it and use it strategically, you know, either on the first three turns or even throughout the course of a game, right? That that turn eight to get you that uh, old Supreme pre-nerf Atromancer early used to feel backbreaking as well. So it's that like tangible thing that makes us subconsciously, at least in my opinion, go like, that's the advantage, right? Even if the stats say otherwise, it's staring at you at the face. And I think that has a lot to do with, you know, that experience, that subjective reality we were talking about. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I mean, it, it, it's an interesting point. I hadn't considered the experience of magic, but you're right. Like for the most part, I want to go second in magic because I want the extra card. And, and, and it, you mentioned initiative, and I feel like that's probably part of what plays into why it feels like that, because in Magic, where the uh, the power, I guess, is on the the, turn, the, the side of the defender, the, the player being attacked, as far as like how blocks go, what co happens in combat, um, that initiative matters less, right? Yeah. So in a game like this, where that initiative matters so much more, because you're the attacker is in control of what their their unit is doing, uh, unless there's an opposing guard, obviously, um, quite a bit different. And I think that probably plays a lot into those feelings. Yeah. So, I, I think that. Uh... Yeah, I, I, I don't know. So the other question that I wanted to ask, right? So I think that the other thing that I usually mention when the ring discussion comes up uh, is, um, and I know what a lot of like entrenched players would say to this, but like, what do you think the experience would be like if a patch was announced tomorrow and they said, oh, by the way, in the patch notes, we're making a change to the ring. I'm not even going to say what the change is, right? Could be more charges, less charges, cool down, um, you know, decay where you have to use it by a certain time. Uh, it goes back to a support that you can target, like whatever it is, they just say like, hey, we're making a change to the ring, right? I'd be curious right. to I mean, it, to to hear what your thoughts would be on what the expected um, like response to that would be. And then if things go sour, like how long do you think people would tolerate it staying that way as well? You know what I mean? Like if it ends up just being horrible, like I, I love theory... Yeah, you know, like the theory crafting is probably the wrong word. Like I love a thought experiment like that, right? Like, okay, let's say we do go through the change. What's the the outcome now? Um, I'll, I'll answer that real quickly. Uh, but I first, I I just as you're speaking, I was thinking, I would love to see a gauntlet mode with a different mechanic than the ring. I feel like you could stealth test something out that way on a absolutely huge too. A gauntlet mode with, uh, you know, let's say you add a little chaos arena element to it where there's like four different possibilities to in lieu of the ring. And uh, you know what you're getting into when you sign up for it, when you hop in, and then you play them out. And then, you know, I think that'd be pretty cool. Uh, I feel like, honestly, the potential for goals in gauntlet mode is, uh, you know, limitless. And I'd love to see some more stuff done there. But um, as far as the reaction, any change goes, uh, I think people who don't play a whole lot are going to be confused. I think that, um, you know, this isn't like eight more than eight deck slots are confusing type confusion. I think like <laughs> legitimate, like legitimate confusion, uh, because the ring is a relatively complicated mechanic for something that's baseline in the game. Right. Uh, at least its implications are complicated. Um, and secondly, I think that you would see a lot of people 
who don't usually complain about the ring suddenly complaining that things are being changed and these are you know going to be a mix of people they're going to be people who have tracked their own data and found that it's statistically irrelevant it's going to be people who don't like change in general it's going to be i, I think that the reaction will be more negative than positive no matter what the change is to be honest with you yeah see that's it's very similar to my train of thought because i do feel like just like with anything right there's always a vocal side of things and then there's the people who ignore it because it's not affecting them yet and so there's a part of me that wonders you know if they made a change how many people would just be upset at a change period and then two if the change is proving to not like be favorable you know how long are people willing to tolerate that being a thing you know what i mean so yeah no i, I totally agree and i mean in in the entire history of, of legends i can only think of I know that there has been one change that was made to a card that was then changed back, but the original change happened in closed beta. <laughs> They've been very good about like sticking to their guns, you know? Yeah. I think that's... I think that's Testament uh, fair. That yeah. research that they're doing internally. Yeah, sure, absolutely. You kind of, like, mini stole my thunder a bit because I, I've, like, uh, toyed with that idea in the past, but I do think that the stealth test of a special mode, right, is is the right path to go if they were to ever explore it. And I think that people would be more open to that if they if they did some wacky things. Um, the other potential option would be uh, like extended stress testing on an invite basis, right? If they yeah. targeted, you know, 20, 30, 50, I don't know what the right number would be, right? But if they just targeted a group of players to say, hey, you know, just like we do with some of the public previews, but instead just for testing, like, um, you know, come sign in, play some games, give us feedback. I think that that, like, almost like extended QA team sort of thing would be, uh, you know, welcomed as well something like that being interesting a part of the reason that i, I generally uh am sort of uh i don't know not like really concerned about the direction the game is ever heading is because like you look at the pedigree of of people who are who are creating and designing this game and it's i mean it's a lot of people it's better players than any of us you know what i'm saying <laughs> i mean certainly better than me uh I don't know about better than you. You are a uh, yeah, a previous win tournament the... winner. Just uh, championship series tournament. That's true. Yeah, that that can never be taken away from you. <laughs> so sometimes people, you know, ask me about my pedigree. I'm actually I'm going to step away for a second. I want to go grab something because I was thinking about this at work today. Um, yeah. I've been playing card games for a long time, and I I often say that I've been playing it for like well over 20 years, and I think that that like doesn't sink in for some people that, one, like how long that is, but I think that sometimes they think it's an exaggeration, but I have something that I want to show off here. 20 years ago, what I was doing? <laughs> 20 years ago, I was, let's see, I would have been 12 years old, so I was shoplifting from grocery stores i one time when i was about 13 i went to a wendy's and we uh there was a a giant cone a giant cone in the, in the lobby of the wendy's and i was really stoned my buddies were like i bet you won't steal that cone and i was like i bet you i will and i stole i, I grabbed it and i jumped into their car i was trying to jump into their car and uh they, they closed the door and they drove off and i and i uh i had to talk to the cops then well, that's what i was doing 20 years ago well like real real talk for a moment um yeah. Like, I don't know, about 20 years ago, but not that long ago, I was not far off. I think the only difference was that I wasn't getting caught. Um, I legit own, like, a park bench that uh, used to be a municipality's park bench, but some buddies of mine and I were underage and drinking, and we were walking home. At least we were safe. We didn't drive, but we were walking home many miles, and we were tired after a late night, so... Mm -hmm we picked up a bench and carried it with us and every time we got tired we would just pop the bench down and sit 
And we did that the entire way home, and then we just never gave the bench back. Nice. Yeah, when I was a teenager, I did stuff like that with cars. So, <laughs> this is what I went to grab, right? This is, so if you guys aren't familiar with the history of, like, magic, there used to be, um, their magic, like, league was called the, like, Arena League. And there was a local store that ran them, and they put up this plaque in it, right? Let's see if we can get the right sizing here for the camera, right? They put up this plaque. Um, actually, we're gonna we're gonna temporarily put up the short break screen. Let's uh, pause this music because it's gonna kick off my trailer music when I put this up. But this is a, at least gonna be like a larger camera, right? So this, if uh, you are unable to see it, is from 1997. Right? This is a plaque with a bunch of different names on it for different seasons, right? So we got like first, second, third, and then it's a name, and then there are points on this for like what your MMR essentially was, your arena point ranking was, for each Magic the Gathering season back then. And when the shop eventually closed, uh, I asked for it because uh, both my name is on this and then uh, my former uh, best friend who sadly committed suicide many years ago, uh, also has his name on this as well, and so I asked for it as like a keepsake, but I am on this from 1997 So when I say like Damn. I'm play I've been playing card games, you know semi-competitively for <laughs> a long time uh, I'm not just like, you know talking out my ass I've, I've been doing it for a bit and I was just I was thinking about that at work today I was like man. I have that plaque that's legit from 1997 and it is 2017, and I am old now. Yeah, I mean, we're getting older. <laughs> That's pretty cool, though, man. I wish I was playing Magic back then. Yeah, it might have kept you out of trouble, you know? Might have. There's, uh, <laughs> there's, there's few things more satisfying than Channel Fireball. I remember when somebody did that for the first time when I was in prison and um, I, I I thought I thought somebody was about to <laughs> lose some life of their own. <laughs> oh, I can only imagine. I will admit, so when it comes to like Magic the Gathering, um, I, I was, I don't know how else to put it other than to say that I was that guy. My favorite thing in the world was to play any deck where I could say the words, do you wish to continue? As like my win condition. Damn. <laughs> right? Like, like legitimately. Yeah. Like that was my favorite thing. Like whether it was an infinite loop combo, whether it was like, I was that, I was that douchebag that was playing like land destruction and standard so that on like turn six, you had no lands and I had all of them. And I could just say like, do you wish to continue? Um, Come on, man. Like I, I, I'll admit like, um, I played Dragonstorm in Standard. I've played, uh, you know, uh, in in Vintage. Uh, I was playing like World Gorger combos for a bit. Like I, I don't know what it is, but there's just something so satisfying about like playing a card and then looking your opponent in the eye and just going, "Do you wish to continue?" That's my favorite words to utter. So, I, I, it's funny. You know, we talked about what we were doing 20 years ago, and that's what you were doing. I've actually kind of changed gear. I used to be. I mean, actually, to be honest, I've never really been like a super competitive guy, but what I what I think about nowadays, which I kind of struggle with actually, is like wondering if zero sum games in general, where there's a winner and a loser, aren't uh, are, are, are maybe sort of in some way bad for us as, as people. Um, I, I know that like collaborative games like Minecraft are kind of boring, <laughs> but I sometimes wonder if like, uh, and this is so off topic, but if we wouldn't all just be better off if there was a way to make more collaborative games more entertaining. I think there are some that are quality entertainment. I don't know if you've ever played the board game like Pandemic or similar board games, but that's essentially like everybody playing against the board. Like in Pandemic, you're all, you're all, you either all win or all lose. Um, it's a pretty well-designed game and it creates a sense of dread. Um, I think Arkham Horror is also that way, right? Like that's, you're all against the board. Uh, that's a fantasy flight game. Uh, also, a special shout out, Fantasy Flight's doing a Fallout game, so uh, you guys should check that out if you like Bethesda products and or Fantasy Flight games, and I'm a nerd who loves both. 
And also, if you're watching this, <clears throat> Bethesda, send me a copy. I would love to stream some uh, Fallout. I'd also love to stream some Clank. Still semi-off topic, but... Clank is amazing. I, I love that game. Yeah, I've been talking with... So I do a, a game night with buddies locally once a week. And I don't have the equipment to do the setup because our location changes sometimes weekly. But as soon as I can come up with the money for a laptop that's at least beefy enough to stream and support multiple webcam inputs because I need one for the tabletop itself and then one for like us the crew. Um, as soon as I can get that in place I'm probably going to start streaming like at least once a week tabletop games. And I would love for that to be Clank. So uh, yeah. Comment on somebody's posts on uh, in the comments section. Uh, Original 1822 is talking about to how he thinks that winners and losers force us to strive and you don't know how strong you are until you've been pushed. Life's about challenges and overcoming it. Uh, I don't disagree with that necessarily philosophically as far as life goes. I mean, certainly uh, I've been through some interesting things in my life and I've come out a better person as a result of it. But I don't know that it's necessarily the healthiest thing all the time to be engaged in that sort of thing as a, uh, as a hobby. I, and you know, somebody else mentioned the versus AI thing. I love playing against the AI. I play more solo arena than I do any other game format. And I do the same thing in um, in the Eternal where I play the, uh, the draft mode against the computer. I, I think those game, those parts of the game are fun. And some of the best ideas I've had for decks that I've taken onto the ladder then were because I had the opportunity to play with cards I wouldn't necessarily play with uh, in solo arena. And I, I, I mean, I've come up with some pretty cool stuff as a result of it. I think there's a lot of value in uh, being able to appreciate winning uh, against the AI, and um, it also it, it just so again subjective reality. It doesn't feel as bad to lose to the AI as it does to a real person. I'll even pay that, that said. That said, like obviously, I love playing Legends, but a big part of that for me is the communal aspect of it. It's not about winning or losing against uh, a human being so much as just having that shared experience, and that's why I, I continue to play zero sum games because I think that. You know, a lot of the time you can have a real positive experience together, which I think is important. I was going to say, but I, I think get... you, could, you could get the same experience from a collaborative game. Go ahead, sorry. Yeah, no, I, I was just going to piggyback off of you to continue to play devil's advocate and say, uh, you know, the challenge and the strive is important, but you can strive against another person or you can strive against your environment. And, and man naturally has always wanted to band together to you know, beat and, and strive against its environment, right? Like, it's the whole reason that we went from hunter-gatherers to planting crops. It's the reason that we artificially alter our environments. It's really just us trying to fight nature better and better as a community. And uh, those those communal games where we all win or all lose, I think, has value in, in teaching those societal principles. Boom. Absolutely. I mean, like humans are ill-equipped in a lot of ways especially psychologically to to process the world at all you know and it's that desire that makes us unsatisfied with the world around us that causes us to do things like build cities develop agriculture so on and so forth uh take drugs um and it's not that you know obviously as as it's a part of being human you should do your best to do your to be the best human you can be but it's not necessarily the case that uh be taken alone just like you're saying yeah. See, started with data and ended with philosophy. We're well-rounded, like somebody with a liberal liberal arts degree. Liberal. Apparently, English was not my major. Is your undergraduate in just liberal arts? No, no. Um, I got a buddy of mine whose undergrad is in God. What did they call it? Multidisciplinary studies. And I always tease him nice. and say he got a degree, and I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up. Yeah. Um, but mine, my undergrad is, I guess, officially in computer information systems with a specialty in database management. Like um, literally the opposite of mine, which is in human services, mental yeah. health counseling. <laughs> so. So, uh, awesome, man. so yeah, um, this is, this has been amazing. This has been fun. Uh, we're going to. Hopefully do this sort of thing regularly, Justin and I, because we've been talking about it for months. Um, and if there's stuff that any of you guys want to see, why don't you real quick write them in the comments. Stuff you want us to talk about in the future, stuff you like, didn't like. I mean, 
we're here to change, here to here to learn. Yeah, I do entirely plan on clipping this, throwing it up on the old YouTube as well. So if you are uh, from the future watching the recorded version of this, make sure to leave comments uh, there as well. And uh, we'll look for some some future topics. State of the game. More V-Nex. Oh, you guys are so, so cute. Yeah, I, I, uh, T, I like this one here. TESL competitive scene versus Gwent competitive scene. Uh, here's my take, short take on that. Gwent is boring. Th that's my take on that. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, I mean, I think that's a little harsh, but it's also your own personal opinion, so I can do nothing to refute it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah this has been a blast thank you all for joining us yep absolutely thank you guys for joining us